Welcome, welcome, welcome. How's everybody doing? Hope you are doing well. My name is Andrew Kuhn, Focus Compounding. Today's date is Tuesday, April 7th, on air with my co-founder, Jeff Gannon. Jeff, how's it going today? Going very well, Andrew. How's it going with you? It is going great. We hope it's going great for everybody else. If this is the first time you're tuning in with us and watching us on YouTube, make sure you hit that subscribe button, thumbs this video up, uh, and a rating review goes a very long way. Uh, before we hop into everything, uh, markets closed today, Jeff, about uh, even, I think. Uh, you know, we, we rallied a little bit and then uh, the market finished unchanged. So, not a lot to talk about there. Uh, before we jump into our topic of the day, this is the Focus Compound Daily. I know I said today is Monday, April 7th, but I meant to say Tuesday. Um, and every single day after the market closed, Monday through Friday, this does get sent out on an investing topic. I also do tweet it out as well. Um, and we'll jump into that in a little bit. But one uh, one of my favorite parts of it is just uh, including interesting links um, that I found throughout the day and stuff that I think would be interesting to other investors. And uh, one of the links was Bill Miller on why coronavirus sell off is a buying opportunity. And um, he actually in the video called it a generational buying opportunity. So make sure you take a look at that. I thought that was uh, an interesting video uh, to be watching. It sounds like he's very uh, bullish on it. Um, this next topic that we went over was interesting as well because this is something that Jeff and I have been talking a lot about. And this is by Ver Veridad Capital. Um, you could join their mailing list. But I also tweeted this out. And they were uh, talking about what is priced in now in the market. And Jeff, I think this is something that you and I have been talking a lot about. And based upon everything, just from looking you know, at a bunch of different stocks, you have said that you feel like it's almost like the best case scenario is priced in. And from reading this uh, report, um, it's a great report. Uh, one thing that I thought was very interesting is they say growth stocks in the United States and Europe are still 30 to 40% more expensive than they were in 2009. Uh, and by contrast, extreme value stocks, so maybe companies that we would focus on, Jeff, are already at a 2009 bottom. Uh, levels in the United States and Europe. So I thought this was just a really interesting piece. And uh, I know uh, the way that they invest is they focus more on, I believe, um, uh, levered companies and building mm -hmm. a portfolio around there. And they take a much more statistical approach to the investing process, uh, but they definitely produce a ton of great content. So uh, take a look at that. I thought, Jeff, you would find this um, this piece pretty interesting. Yeah. Um, so one thing about that is I was looking recently, running some screens and did notice that a lot of the stocks we don't talk about as much in this podcast are at the kinds of lows you'd expect for a recession. So I think on a screen I ran that I have to clean it up a little bit for uh, any computer error that can be cleared up by human uh, oversight of it. But I think there are about 48 net nets in the U.S. now. There have been times where wow. there are almost none. Um, several are names I recognize. I recognized one company has paid a dividend. It's a net net. It's paid a dividend for about 50 straight years, um, things like that. So that, that kind of thing, although companies like that often trade a lot cheaper than growth stocks and look kind of cheap, they look really cheap. And when I said net net, sorry, I mean uh, two thirds of net current asset value, not just uh, net current asset value. So there's almost 50 stocks that are at two thirds of net current asset value. Those tend to almost always work out as a group um, in a big way. So that, and then I ran another screen, which was also a, a thing that Ben Graham came up with later in his life, as sort of a simple way of doing things, which mainly is just a low PE and a low debt to equity ratio. I also came up with a lot of stocks when normally you have basically none. So just kind of single digit PE stocks with uh, very little debt to equity. Um, so those are real value stocks, statistical values, and they're showing up in a larger way now, uh, much more so than you'd expect based on just the decline in the overall market. So something's happening where your growth stocks uh, are still pretty expensive or the big stocks are pretty expensive. When I say those net nets, the vast majority of them are under 100 million in market cap or just a few hundred million, things like that. But so micro cap value stuff has gotten pretty cheap. From looking at those companies, what's the typical capital structure? Are they are they levered? Is that why they've you know in that net net territory or two thirds of net current assets, or is it just really things have just gotten so beaten down in that space? Yeah, they're not levered. It's um, uh, they're generally not great businesses, uh, though some are okay businesses. But they're um, they're they're things that haven't grown a lot for a decade or so. They're things that are not usually tied to technology things. I mean, some of the net nets are medical related things like uh, 
were biotech things and stuff that blew up. But a lot of them are more um, old economy type things. They're generally uh, a lot of them have been profitable in the past. They just haven't grown. Some of them carry more cash than other companies would. Um, things like that. I would say they, they're they've they're stocks that have been fairly flat for I don't know five years or something before this started. So and that's often how you get net nets. So you get net nets usually because the business performance is okay for a long time while the stock performance is lagging. And then some big drop or something happens or the reverse. There's a big drop. And then afterwards, the stock uh, recovers, uh, the business recovers, but not the stock that happened like in the 30s into the 40s and stuff. So that's what I'm seeing where generally the stocks really underperform the market for five, six, seven years. They're real value stocks. They don't have any of the quality or growth aspects that people were looking for. And then they also decline by as much as the big growth stocks did. So because of that, if you started out at 10 times your average past earnings or something, and then you drop 30%, um, now you're really cheap. And same thing, some of these things were not that high above uh, net current asset value, and now they're at two thirds. So there's a lot of them. I mean, the one that isn't on the list, but we've mentioned before is Tandy Leather, which is a good example of the kind of stock that shows up on it. Tandy Leather's not on the list because it hasn't filed a um, updated uh, SEC filing that balance sheet that would show that it should be on the list. But if you use their balance sheet as of a year or so ago that they did file, they would be a net net or, or they'd be close to two thirds of net current asset value now. So that's a good example for you. That's a stock that went nowhere for a long time for reasons specific to the company. And then it dropped basically in line with a lot of other stocks, whereas the business uh, balance sheet wouldn't have deteriorated that much. We don't have an updated balance sheet, but I wouldn't be surprised if when we do get one, that one also joins the net net list. Does that company worry you because they have operating leases and stuff like that? But they, they do have operating. On? Sure, they, they have operating leases world? and stuff. Uh, I haven't seen the latest balance sheet. We don't know. I would expect. Why is that coming sheet. out? We don't know. I mean, they they can't put out a balance sheet until they they file an updated uh, 10K with the SEC. So they haven't filed in like a year. Um, so they haven't been able to say anything. They haven't been able to do earnings releases. They haven't been able to do anything until they get updated on that. I don't know that it will come out. It may be that they just get delisted and then they stop filing with the SEC um, because they're in danger of that happening. So I don't know. As of this moment, I haven't heard any updated things on that. They would run the risk of being delisted pretty soon if they don't file an updated SEC uh, report. The reason for not having an SEC report out at Tandy is that they had a problem with their um, inventory accounting. But my guess, which I don't know, is that before this coronavirus thing, we had like a almost a year lag in terms of the balance sheet that we'd be seeing. And so I would expect that inventories would be lower and cash would be higher than what we saw the last balance sheet. But I don't know that. The company's pretty cash generative, so I wouldn't be surprised if they have a lot of cash uh, when they update their balance sheet. Got it. Yeah, that's going to be uh, interesting to, uh, uh, to follow. In other news, uh, Michael Burry. He's joined Twitter, Jeff, and he's already okay. up to almost 36,000 followers. Yesterday when I looked, he was at 12. <laughs> so he's, he's on Twitter and he's active on Twitter now. So for anybody that uh, does not follow him yet, make sure you give him a follow. This is, in his words, real personal account of the real weird one from the book and the movie, <laughs> etc. <cetera. laughs> um, Jeff, you sent me this letter last night. Or this, or, okay. I'm sorry, this morning. Uh, billionaire. How do you pronounce this guy's last name? Is it Fertitta? Sure. Billionaire Fertitta right. offers record 15% loan rate to save Empire. Um, so obviously, a lot of his businesses are tied to restaurants, casinos, and entertainment and stuff like that. He owns the Houston Rockets. And you know what's just so crazy to me, Jeff, is I didn't read his book. He just came out with a book uh, within the past year, I know. But I've listened to him speak on podcasts before, and I like recently, and I know that he ran a public company, and then he took the company private. And the crazy part, Jeff, is when I was listening to the podcast, he kept on saying, he kept stressing that something else is going to come eventually, and that mm. the way that he invests is he always waits for basically shit that the fan, and then he goes in, and then that's when he likes to acquire, 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 right? Mm. And he was also talking about his reluctance to debt. He doesn't like debt and stuff like that because he just likes cash. He likes the, the ability to um, weather the storm. And then, like I said, when 
everybody else is, you know, getting a margin called or, or um, all their loans are coming due. He likes to come in and just acquire these companies. And this just shows to me, and obviously I don't know what his financial situation was with the business. Maybe he had debt, maybe he didn't. I don't know. Um, I'm just kind of speaking from his, his own words. But this just shows how much this virus has really rocked the economy. If a guy that is, uh, you know, allegedly, um, uh, you know, runs his business to be very financially conservative, if, you know, he's having to raise debt to, quote unquote, save his empire, you know, so it's just, it's just crazy. It's just a crazy time we're in. And I thought that was a pretty interesting article. Do you have any thoughts on it? Uh, yeah. So I was also going to say the same thing was true for Carnival. So Carnival is a really good example because of what you were saying. That was their strategy historically. So they were always had better uh, credit than others in the industry. They were formed a lot of times by buying out other companies in the industry when they got themselves into trouble, like the restaurant industry, maybe even more so. The cruise industry had successful um, concepts, successful cruise lines that had financial trouble because they would grow as fast as possible. They'd buy these ships. They'd put on a lot of debt. Um, there are reasons why that kind of growth is uh, profitable. But as soon as you ran into any sort of trouble, they they just had too much debt and they would need someone with cash to come in and to, to take them over. And they did that a lot. And you can see the same thing. You know, Carnival, we know, borrowed at like 12% or something. They had to issue stock at an incredibly low valuation and all that. And um, for the same reason, they're completely shut down. So those kinds of businesses, like the, the ones that he owns, um, and he... This would happen to any restaurant thing, although more of the chains that uh, more of the concepts that Landry's owns are tied to specific venues and stuff a little bit more. They do own some things that are uh, that you'd recognize as just around here um, as chains, but a lot of them are tied to more like uh, destination locations and things like that, which will be more hurt for a longer period of time, too. So that would be difficult, you know, um, casinos, Las Vegas, things associated with theme parks and other high venue areas and stuff, high traffic venues uh, will be more affected longer than just uh, if we were talking about, you know, things that are, you know, Olive Garden or something. So the, because people have asked about that and that stuff also gets hurt in a recession too. But obviously the problem here is just right now getting through it. So yeah, it's happened to lots of companies and it has nothing to do with how they were run before. No company can survive this sort of uh, thing usually. It's crazy. It's just absolutely crazy. But like the biggest takeaway you know, uh, to me, Jeff is mm. again, I don't know what his financial situation was other than like what's public. I don't know what their balance sheet looked like, but from what he verbally and publicly has said, it sounds like, you know, that's sort of his, his, uh, strategy is to always have a ton of cash, not a lot of debt to be able to take advantage of, um, you know, when, when things go wrong. And again, it's, it's kind of like cheesecake factory, right? That company is pretty uh -huh. well capitalized other than having a bunch of operating leases and, you know, they're going through the same thing. So it's just, yep. it's just crazy. Um, J Jamie Dimon came out with his letter to shareholders. And for some reason on the website, I couldn't highlight, which was kind of annoying. Okay. So I copied it into a Word file. And I thought yeah. it was a great letter. And, and we can um, go through it and discuss it. And then just talk a little bit about banks, Jeff, uh, especially with everything going on. And, um, you know, this letter was very well written. Um, I'm a big Jamie Dimon fan. So is so is Jeff. And, um, you know, he talked about his employees, about the culture. We don't need to go into all of that. Uh, I would definitely recommend everybody listening to read it. But I'm really just more curious to talk about stuff that he, you know, thinks about the current state of the economy, this pandemic, and how that relates to J.P. Morgan. And um, before we jump into that, we could talk. So I have uh, just a couple of banks up here. It looks like a lot of banks have rebounded, you know, along with the whole market from the lows. And um, I'm assuming, uh, let's see, J.P. Morgan's trading around eight, yeah. eight times earnings. And I have Wells Fargo, Citigroup. They're all kind of in that same area. And then Bank of Hawaii is a little bit more expensive in prosperity, which I guess those are different banks than uh, I would consider them different banks than J.P. Morgan, Wells Fargo, Citigroup, et cetera. Um, but this was a great letter. And I think Jamie Dimon is a titan. And I think he's someone that everyone should study. And the first part that I highlighted of this letter is what he talks about uh, the crisis a little bit. And I'll just read it and we could you know, chat about it. He says, we entered this crisis in a position of strength. 2019 was another strong year for JP Morgan Chase with the firm generating record revenue and net income. 
as well as set, setting numerous other records across our lines of businesses. We earned a $36.4 billion in net income on revenue of $118.7 billion, which is just incredible, absolutely incredible, uh, reflecting strong underlying performance across our businesses. We now have delivered record results in nine of the last 10 years and are confident, and we are confident we will continue to do so in the future, though it should be expected that our earnings will be down meaningfully in 2020. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, he's coming out and saying it. Have you seen uh, Obviously, a lot of companies are coming out and saying that. Um, but, I mean, $36.4 billion net income on revenue of $118 million, uh, I'm sorry, $118 billion is just pretty mm -hmm. incredible, I thought. And they have their uh, EPS and return on tangible capital employed um, all since 2004. And it's just been a, a steady riser. Have you ever looked in depth at JP Morgan, Jeff? I have looked a little bit at J.P. Morgan. I was going to say Buffett probably wishes that he owned J.P. Morgan instead of um, Wells Fargo right now. I think he likes J.P. Morgan a lot. Um, I know from the book, uh, there have been a couple of books written about uh, Jamie Dimon. And um, one actually is about Sandy Weil, but it covers Jamie Dimon a lot. But the other one is the... Um, what was the one that was uh, Last Man Standing or something yeah, like last that? Man standing. Yeah, yeah that's the more that's, that's the one, one from the last financial crisis. Yeah, so that's a if you just want to learn about Jamie Dimon specifically, that's the good one to read. There is one that's more about his time at at Citigroup and stuff. Um, so uh, anyway, in that book and I, in other places I've read before, it's obvious that Jamie Dimon bases his letters and stuff off of the Buffett letters because early on in his career he was reading them when no one else was. You know, he was fascinated by Buffett's letters. Um, yeah. so I, I think that, uh, yeah, Buffett would, uh, wish that he owned a, more of a bank that was run by diamond than uh, what he has with Wells Fargo. But, um, I have looked at I mean, he says over. that he says yeah. everything that you would want your CEO to say, right? While we don't run the company worrying about the stock price in the short term and the long run, our stock price is a measure of the progress we have made over the years. This progress is a function of continual investments in good and bad times to build our capabilities, our people, systems, and products. Um, what were you going to say? Yeah, so if you go back to that chart, um, if we see, I think, the second one, the tangible book value and average stock price per share. So mm -hmm. the tangible book value as of the annual report was $61, right? And the only time that the two really uh, were in line was back about seven years ago or so, seven or eight years ago at around $40. Um, other than that, you had to pay a bit of a premium, which is fine if the company earns a, a, a nice return over their tangible uh, um, equity. But the problem has been like in really recent years, if you look, there has been a pretty big gap. So you could have bought it around the crisis time and, and things like that at pretty close to tangible book value. But if we look, the return on, it, on tangible equity, while good, um, it's very good for a bank, is not so high that you want to pay any price to book for this. This is a really big company. So uh, what's the price that we have on it right now? Of uh, the stock? Yeah. It is currently trading $90.46. 90 so that's 1.5 times uh, what their tangible book value was before, I guess, something like that. Whereas um, they, at their low, they might have been 1.25 times or something. Uh, that's okay. You know, I think 1.5 times tangible book is fine for this. If you look at what their return on equity has been normally, return on tangible equity has been normally, I think that's the chart right above that. Uh, the slightly higher chart is got, um, let's see. So the percentages that they have there are the return on tangible equity is the last one that you see. So the, you know, the, of, on the legend there, you can see that the third one is that. So you can mm -hmm. see the percentages there. Yeah. So if your percentages are in the 10 to 15% range, then obviously it's perfectly fine to pay up to 1.5 times tangible book. So that's where we are now. So it's possible. It's good. But like you said, they'll be down meaningfully right now. So it, it's, I think it's an attractive enough price long-term right now to own the stock, but it's not, the bargain of the century at the moment. Uh, it was a bit better bargain, you know, at the lows, and mm -hmm. we'll see, you know. Um, but you're paying 1.5 times tangible book for something that's definitely going to earn a lot less than 15% return on tangible equity for a little while. Sure. Uh, yeah, I mean, and even he says that, um, you know, that earnings are going to be meaningful, lo meaningfully lower. Um, uh, let's see. So we don't run the company. We already went over that. 
Let's see. There's some other stuff. They went, uh, here we go, dealing with an extraordinary crisis. And he says, a corporation, essentially any institution, is a living, breathing organism made up of people, technology, institutional knowledge, and relationships, and is generally organized around mission and purpose. Entering into a crisis is not the time to figure out what you want to be. You must already be a well-functioning organization and prepared for rapidly mobilize Oh, I'm sorry, to rapidly mobilize your resources, take your losses and survive another day for the good of all your stakeholders. Um, and then, you know, he was talking about his principles. And even in that book, Jeff, that we both read, Last Man Standing, he always talks about, you know, having a fortress balance sheet and how he's always sort of had that mindset. And he goes into his principles here again. And he, uh, you know, says the need for extremely talented and motivated employees, a fortress ba balance sheet that allows us to invest in good times and in bad times, uh, clear comprehension and accurate financial risk and operating reporting to let us make quick and accurate decisions, a devotion to our customers and communities, and continuous investing in technology to better serve both our employees and our customers. I mean, are they the most well-capitalized bank? I mean, I guess cons uh, comparing to Wells Fargo? Uh, they are well capitalized. I haven't looked specifically at Wells Fargo recently. Wells Fargo has an interesting thing because they have a cap on their assets because of their um, basically their account scandal and stuff like that, which causes some weird things. So they won't be able to expand their credit unless they're allowed to relieve that cap. So just in terms of credit lines and stuff, the credit lines based on what JP Morgan was saying, if you apply those same ideas to Wells Fargo, um, Wells Fargo would go over the cap. So Wells Fargo has to be telling people they can't do certain things unless... Um, uh, the Fed uh, lets them out of that. Um, but yeah, JP Morgan for a very big bank is extremely well capitalized. It's very liquid too. Uh, they, they get into some detail on that in the balance sheet, but in terms of just the leverage ratio and stuff, it's very good. Uh, banks generally are pretty good in the US. Uh, they're going to get, it's going to look a lot worse um, because, well, I think it will look a lot worse. It'll be complicated. We don't know. I think a lot of companies will also be putting their, um, I don't know how much money will be leaving the banking system. Because although a lot of people are going to draw credit lines, a lot of money is just going to be deposited in banks. So um, some banks actually will have a weird problem, especially, especially the smaller banks may even have a problem where they feel that they're getting too much deposits too quickly. Um, so, which is not in the long run a bad thing for a bank. Uh, I mean, I would consider a bank pretty safe. It was getting lots of deposits that were expected to stick around for a long time. But from like a regulatory perspective and a balance sheet perspective, that that does create some problems initially. For these banks, they're going to have a lot of the credit lines drawn, which is what JP Morgan was talking a little bit about. In fact, they said, I think uh, in this letter too, that in addition to actually having credit lines drawn, the companies also requested that they have um, additional abilities to borrow beyond that added too. So if you do the math on like how long that was and stuff, that's pretty significant. So the only risk that I see to them, uh, JP Morgan and everyone else, is they're going to have to manage um, sometimes more simultaneous drawing of credit lines than normal, uh, than not just that's normal, that's ever happened probably in history. Um, because it's fine that those really don't present much of a problem, but if everyone draws them at the exact same moment, it has elements of it that are kind of like a run on a bank. Uh, bank runs don't happen anymore because of FDIC insurance and all that, but you can have everyone try to draw their credit lines at the same time. And that's the only thing that I see for bigger banks or any banks that work with a lot of businesses, they will have some unusual stuff happening that way beyond what happened in the financial crisis. Um, but other stresses might not be as bad. In fact, he talks about com comparing it to the financial crisis in that paragraph they have there. Mm -hmm. um, he goes on to talk about transparency with the, uh, with the shareholders and what to expect regarding financial and operating performance in 2020. And, you know, he was basically saying that JP Morgan obviously is not going to be immune to the stress. Um, and that the major thing was that they stopped buying back their stock. And he says that we've always held the position that the highest and best use of our equity is to reinvest it in our own business and, of course, to be able to withstand tough times. Halting buybacks was simply a very prudent action. We don't know exactly what the future will hold, but at a minimum, we assume that it will include a bad recession combined with some kind of financial stress similar to the global financial crisis of 2008. Our bank cannot be immune to the effects of this kind of stress. That's a pretty strong statement there, Jeff. Yeah, I mean, I think it's it's true, though. Yeah, it is a strong statement, but I think it's true. I mean, do you uh, have have you seen a lot of companies coming out and saying 
that, and that you know, we're, we they're saying that it's going to cause financial stress similar to 2008? Uh, I haven't seen them say that, but it already it has caused some financial stress in some areas that they do business in. Um, for instance, without changes to government regulations on some stuff and things like that, I think there would have been problems in the treasury market continuing to happen, which is obviously financial stress for these companies. They do business in that. JP Morgan also talks about how it, bank, it, it is the banker for a lot of other banks. Um, obviously, it can't be immune to stresses on those banks um, who aren't always in better positions, like I said, uh, smaller banks to deal with the volumes that they're going to see. Um, the, there will also be stress just, um, at, what would they want to call it, operational stress or something on these banks, the amount of loan applications for some of the programs they're going to do that they're going to have to um, f- uh, process is way beyond anything they've ever done. I mean, we're talking like 10 times or more um, what normal volumes would be for some things. And they're going to have, um, and they're also going to have some things related to eventually losses in certain um, industries. And we'll see how they structure that and everything. But these are all very diversified. So that means that they're lending to all sorts of stuff that will run into weird problems. Um, The things that we talked about, like um, restaurants and things like that, sure. But also things like um, all sorts of strange things. There'll even be problems in like healthcare things and stuff. Because healthcare for a time, a brief time, will be used heavily for coronavirus stuff. Which means all sorts of other healthcare stuff won't be going on. And it'll cause problems for them. Um, So it'll just be lots of things they can restructure and work on. And there's already been changes to regulations to help them use more of their capital to actually deploy it and stuff. Um, big banks like JP Morgan. So I don't, this will be very, very different than the 2008 financial crisis, but there will be stresses and they may come in waves that are later in the cycle for banks. Um, banks were the first part of what happened last time. They were the source of it, but this time the source is businesses. And so um, banks will be affected to the extent that businesses are, which means that they'll kind of have it happen to them second. Um, They won't be the leading cause of it here. So it'll be very different that way. But yeah, it'll be stressful for some banks. JP Morgan has a, like we said, has a very strong balance sheet and has uh, plenty of liquidity and also just has easy access to lots of things that they might need to. So they're very good position to, all the biggest banks I can think of that you have listed there are in a good position um, this time versus last time, but it'll be stressful. Do you think it's a good time to invest in banks? It could potentially be a good time to invest in banks. Um, it, it really depends on their, it depends a lot on their prices. Um, I think, yes, I think banks are one of, I mean, I think that small value stocks are the best place to invest right now. But if you were managing a lot of money, billions of dollars, I think that banks are the most interesting area right now. Yeah, definitely. Okay. Okay, now let's talk about then for people that are just managing their own money, right? And mm-hmm. maybe they're not managing billions of dollars. What would you be looking for in a bank? Would it be uh, would it be going to you know the bigger banks, for example, because they're potentially safer, I guess, uh, than maybe community banks? How would you be thinking about that? Well, you shouldn't. Uh, well, I would not say that. I mean. I really want it. I know people think that that's true. Uh, I mean, they're generally safer than community banks, but banks are safer not depending on how they're run and certain other things that you can analyze. So you have listed there Cullen Frost. Uh, okay. So we can take another bank, uh, Texas uh, Capital Bank Shares, I think the name of it is. So if you go in, I don't know if you can get a quote on Texas Capital Bank Shares, but I'll use Texas Capital Bank Shares as an example. It's a Dallas based uh, bank, it has branches around here of a bank that I would be more cautious of. Then, What's it called uh, again? Sorry. Uh, Texas Capital Bank is TCBI is the ticker, something like that. Let's see what the ticker is. Um, the ticker yeah. is TCBI. Yep. All right. So can we get a quick FS on them so I can right. show you some things about them? All right. So anyway, so uh, a lot of people might look at that and say, here's a cheaper stock. I think it's cheaper than Frost, let's say, for instance. But I'll give some caution with a bank like this. And I'm not, I'm, this is not the worst bank in the world or something. I'm not picking it because of that. I'm just giving it as an example. It's a bank around here that I could uh, know. In fact, I mentioned a stock before, uh, an insurer that has some connections with this just in terms of the people involved. But okay, so let's look at this. So you can see it's cheap, right? So people might be interested. Price to book is deep discount, right? PE is, what is that? Three, four. Um, so let's look at some of the issues here though. 
So we can just look on a, um, a leverage basis. So there's lots of different ways, risk adjusted leverage and stuff that you'd be looking at normally. Risk adjusted capital ratios, which is more like what regulation would be based on and what you'll hear banks talk about more. But if you look there, there's a line that says earning assets to equity. So earning assets to equity, which is the third line up from the bottom, is um, going to show you their leverage ratio, which is basically how much they have in loans and securities. Those are the earning assets relative to the, tan um, hopefully that's calculating the tangible common equity, uh, which, is, um, it, which is giving you that ratio. And that ratio is basically going to show you how they convert asset return into equity return. So if you look, if that was, say, 10 times, which is a number I give a lot as sort of normal or whatever, well, 10 times will turn a return on assets of like 1% or so into like 10% or higher. So 1% to 2% return on assets leveraged at like 10 times or more gives you a nice return on equity. But if you look, there are some things about this that are a little bit concerning, which is it's a bit higher, not terrible, but a bit higher. So um, you've had it at times, which is like 12 and stuff like that. Uh, those kinds of numbers would mean you invert it. So you get numbers of like only 8% of their balance sheet is, is equity. But then you also see that there's a big decline recently, right, in the leverage that they have. You also look at things like loans to deposits. So Quick FS luckily gives us loans to deposit ratios. So loans to deposits means that they're lending out basically all of their deposits when you see that, if it's 100%. Now, that's something to be a little cautious about. It's not the worst thing. I've, I've looked at banks that have high amounts of loans to deposits. If I think their deposits are great and I think their loans are um, very good, but you still need liquidity and stuff, which probably means that being more in securities is a little more comforting for me. So, um, uh, And then you also have your loan loss reserves to your loans. Now, this does not give us charge offs, which would be more useful to have. Um, because loan loss reserves, a lot of, not a lot, but some banks will have pretty high loan loss reserves, but actually not very high charge offs and um, vice versa. So if we put in, and then you see the growth, right? So you have the tremendous growth, which can be great, but can also be a bit of a concern. So over 10 years, they've grown deposits at 20% a year. Um, what does that mean? Every four years or something, they've doubled, maybe quicker than that. So on that basis, you know, in 10, 12 years, they've, they've doubled several times. This bank went from having, um, uh, so let's take net interest income, for instance. They you know, quadrupled that in 10 years. So it's a lot of growth and stuff. There could be concerns about that. You also look at the net interest margin. This company has a presentation where you can see what kinds of um, yields they were getting. In general, if you're getting higher yields, it could mean that you're taking some more risk and stuff like that. Uh, a lot of times people focus on the exact industries the bank is in. I'm not as concerned about that necessarily as like um, more what kind of risks and stuff they're taking. So let's go and then put Frost in there and said CFR and compare that to them so we can look at their ratios. Um, and I also mentioned a website a long time ago, Deposit Health or something like that, it's called. You can do, it will calculate a Texas ratio for you. Um, you can, can do the calculation yourself. So let's look at some differences here, right? Earning assets to equity, it's a bit lower, right? Okay, so if yeah. you look at the third to bottom line, it's a bit lower. So in fact, Frost hasn't really topped about 10 times at any point there. It's been single digits, which means that effectively, if, uh, for the most part, there's some little complications. But basically, they've had 10% or more of their tangible uh, their balance sheet formed by tangible equity. So not a lot of leverage on that. Then if you look at loans to deposits, right, it's usually like 50% or less in the last 10 years. Okay, now... The only way that Frost, so Frost survived the um, big downturn in the in the 80s in Texas real estate markets, Texas banking markets, whatever, which eliminated all the top banks in Texas. But the reason that they survived that um, is that I think at early on in that crisis, they were lending out about 30% of their uh, deposits. And uh, they explained that by saying that, you know, they always thought that just because you take in the money doesn't mean you have to lend it out. So eventually they stopped lending against things where other people kept lending in the worst points of it to like um, office buildings that weren't full yet and stuff. So, uh, I mean, office buildings are being built, even though there were already big vacancies in cities. So that sort of thing can protect you and can give you a lot more liquidity because half of their our balance sheet is made up of basically municipal bonds and things like that. You'll notice that the loan loss reserves are not necessarily a lot higher. I uh, mean, I'm sorry, not necessarily a lot lower. And I wouldn't say that loan loss reserves are a um, great indicator. They're supposed to be, but I don't know that they're always a great indicator. You'll see a lot that despite the fact that it's supposed to be smoothing out the cycle and everything, um, banks may even raise their loss reserves after the point that they also already get hit by the big charge off. So they're not usually that fast to know what's about to happen. Um, you also can look at the growth rates 
And although it's great to invest in a financial services business insurer or bank that's growing really fast, generally those are the riskier ones. So here you have deposit growth that's about 7% a year or something like that, right? So 7 8% a year, that means you're only going to double your deposits about every decade. So that's a much smoother way of doing things. And if you think about how much inflation there is in the economy and everything, you're not actually making that many totally new loans, totally new relationships and things all that frequently. So I'm a lot more comforted by how slowly you can evolve in terms of the risks that you're taking and stuff, as opposed to a bank that's growing so fast that they're they're basically doubling the um, the either the amount of loans they're making or the size of the loans they're making every three or four years. That's hard to do, you know. Um, so those are the differences. I'm not saying that Texas Capital Bank is a terrible stock or that Frost is a great stock. I'm just saying that when I look at a 10-year numbers like this or something, I feel a little bit more comforted by that. So if we can put in JP Morgan so you can see what they look like. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So you can see the um, you can only see the tail end of it here, but you'll notice that the um, biggest banks in the U.S., including J.P. Morgan, were much worse positioned as the last crisis than other banks in the country. So even Frost and stuff deleveraged, but it was much more a thing that happened to the biggest banks. The New York banks and stuff are the ones that were much more um, have shifted completely in terms of the risks that they're taking and stuff. So if you look again, earning access to equity right? That's very low. Um, historically, I mean, just there were times if we could go take this back to like the crisis and stuff, there were times at which some of these numbers are almost double. Um, there's uh -huh. almost double the amount of leverage. Yeah. And so, but if we also look at loans to deposits, it's higher than at Frost, right? But still, JP Morgan is not lending out anywhere near all their deposits. And again, I don't want to say that every bank that lends out all of its deposits is in some sort of bad state, but it's obviously, you know, that's, and you can get in trouble with securities too. But in general, having a, a mix of loans and deposits, I would say is safer. It depends on what kind of loans you're making. You could be making loans that are, uh, most banks don't, but you could be making loans that are very short-term liquid tied to business things that are going to turn into cash really quickly and stuff. That's not usually the kinds of loans that banks make. So your securities just give you a lot more liquidity. Um, and then if you look at like the loan loss reserves, right? You can see that they were what I was saying. So you can see they were very high. Even JP Morgan had extremely high loan loss reserves going back a ways. Mm -hmm. And now they're a lot lower. Um, but then also things about the growth and stuff. It's not that dramatic growth, right? The companies come back. But look, that growth means that they've less than doubled their deposits in something like 10 years, I think. So the amount of loans that they've made, it hasn't grown faster than the economy. It hasn't grown faster really than the, the size of the businesses that they work with and stuff. So I'm just much more comforted if he's saying the things he is, if you think you understand the culture, how much could it really change in 10 years versus trying to get a handle on something like Texas Capital Bank shares. So I would just say there are lots of ways that you can do these things. You can look at what things that regulators look at. You can look at Texas ratios. You can look at all that. To me, something like JP Morgan and something like Frost, too, to be honest, although Frost has exposure, just like Bank of Hawaii has exposure that are specific to where they are in the industries and means it's much riskier than JP Morgan. Frost is a riskier bank than JP Morgan just because it's concentrated in certain places that can get hit, whether that's energy sector or Texas and at a certain time, they're not as diversified. But absent the diversification stuff, I'm just giving you examples of those are two banks that I think are more the kinds of things you'd look at for safety than say Texas Capital Bank shares. And again, I could have picked, I could pick a bank in every state that looks like Texas Capital Bank shares. That's not a unique thing. I'm not saying that's a stock you should short or something. I'm just saying it's a stock that is riskier than what we're talking about. Thanks for the for the clarification. You're gonna get a bunch of emails. I own that bank, and here's why you're wrong. Blah blah blah. Uh, I'm sure it's been. I mean, I assume it's been a great stock for the last ten years or something. Yeah, it probably has been, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, so, uh, Focus Cop Honey Daily, again, I meant to, I should have put Tuesday there. That was my bad. Uh, somebody sent you an email saying, what kind of competition will car dealers face for the sale of used cars and for their parts and service business? And somebody emailed you about this, and your answer was, I think big car dealer groups have certain advantages in capturing additional profits from a customer relationship based on a new car sale, but the internet may change things over time. So, tell me a little bit about this, Jeff. Yeah. So first of all, if people haven't, they should go to um, your Twitter or wherever at and watch Focus the, Compound. at Focus Compound and watch the interview uh, that they had with this, that the interview that you tweeted out with the CEO of Virtue Motors, because that is sort of the reason why people are asking these questions and stuff to me, because they know about 
us um, accounts that I manage owning Virtu Motors. They saw that great interview uh, that you tweeted out. It's a really good interview. Um, so this is the question I get a lot because if, even when the stock was a lot, uh, even before all the economic stuff going on now, the shutdown and all that, um, when car dealers, people weren't necessarily expecting them to do worse, there was always the question that people have for why would I invest in like a car dealer? Now, Buffett, uh, Berkshire Hathaway bought a car dealership group and stuff. Uh, generally, people think that the industry is going to be disrupted more um, and face a lot more competition than I think, basically. Uh, and the reason for that is, so the... Uh, car dealers make money on a variety of different things. UK car dealers don't break it out, but US car dealers do. They make money on stuff that has to do with um, what they call, I think they call it finance and warranties or something like that, finance. And, and it, anyway, it, it's a category that they use that includes all the other stuff that's sold with a car, including potentially a car loan um, that they're not keeping on their books or anything, but they're just making, uh, making the loan in the sense of it's being sold off to someone else. So things like that, uh, they get an immediate profit on. And it's a meaningful amount of profit versus uh, what it seems to be in terms of revenue. Like I said, UK car dealers don't break it at all. They put it in with the car. So they sell a used car, a new car or something. Anything that comes from other stuff sold with the car appears as if it was um, uh, the profit from the car. But they sell a lot of new cars, but new cars generate very little gross profit for them. And gross profit is what matters, not um, revenue. And then secondly, you have... Uh, the used car sales, used cars generate a lot more gross profit. And then the really big contributor for them in terms of gross profit is often service revenue. So the question is, what will they lose these companies over time in terms of used cars and service revenue more so than new cars? So the internet creates competition, but the tricky thing, and this is probably why Buffett bought um, Van Tull, is that over a very long period of time, the number of dealerships in the U.S. has been declining, and especially the amount of big dealer groups has been increasing, so that even if the number, like if we take a number and compare the total number of dealers to the total number of drivers, it's gotten much, much, much better over time. Uh, so that just means that if the internet comes in in a way somehow that disrupts things for dealers, and it can be a little difficult to figure out how much that will actually happen, um, if the decline in sales for the overall industry of dealers doesn't, isn't as great as the decline in the number of dealerships, then you get better economics per dealership that you have. So some of these things aren't necessarily that bad. Like if you're selling more things online and so far these, uh, Virtu sells more online than some, uh, companies do, and it has more of a presence online stuff than some other car dealers. But it still is not a very big part of the, the industry to actually close the deal online. So it's a very big part of like getting leads, of getting people almost to buying into coming into your dealership, of, of doing all the research and stuff and having an idea of what they want to buy. But it's not a big part of actually closing deals. So my point was just if the number of dealerships declines by as much or more than the number of de the declines that might happen for other things. And that can also include things like ride sharing and stuff, say people use fewer cars. It's just likely that the dealer numbers will decline more. The other thing is that you tie up less capital if you move to a model in which you can serve a wider, um, num a bigger number of people, uh, a wider radius around your dealerships. So there's the potential if you're operating 200 dealerships or something to like banks have been able to cut down the number of branches they have to cut that down to, you know, um, two thirds of that or something. And then you serve more people. That means you own less real estate, which is one of the more expensive Owning real estate or leasing it is probably the most expensive use of capital that dealers have. They have good financing arrangements on their cars, so it's not as big a deal. But uh, what holds down their returns a lot of times is the land that they have to use. So it's actually very possible that you could have tons of competition from this stuff and have higher returns on capital in the industry. What are your thoughts on this model, right? Uh, so you order online and then they deliver the car here and it takes out, I guess, the need of a car dealership. There's one of these right, I mean, within close proximity of where you live, right? Um, sure. And you're starting to see these pop up more and more. I mean, what are your thoughts on those? I, I typed in car vending machine. <laughs> yes. <laughs> that's what so, it's the, like. yeah, they use, car, car, they use the car vending machine thing at Carvana too. Get, to get, draw people's attention to it, right? So Carvana's business model, uh, I have looked at Carvana and I think it's, um, 
I think it has potential. So Carvana isn't making money and stuff right now, but I think that what I see in the economics of it makes sense. That actually, in terms of the gross profits that it hopes to achieve per car and things like that, that you know, there, there's a real possibility there for it, it to um, make quite a bit of money when it scales up. So it's not something that I'm like, I don't get the business model of Uber or something. I get the business model of Carvana. It's just not mature enough yet. But Carvana's business model is different than car dealers in that Carvana is really bringing uh, people together to sell the car. Um, it's, uh, I don't know what you compare it to other than like, um, there's some companies in jewelry and stuff that have done this online, which is that instead of holding the inventory and stuff themselves, what they're really do, doing, whether they're telling you this exactly or not, is that they're basically brokering a deal and they are providing some peace of mind and a place where the deal will happen and all of that. But it's basically a place in which car deals happen as opposed to a car dealership. Um, and that I think is realistically, uh, the option that can compete with car dealers. Um, I think that's very possible. So the Carvana type model, if you look at exactly what that is, I think is the kind of thing that could um, compete with car dealers over time. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. I, I always think it's pretty cool. And, and car dealers themselves. Yeah. And car dealers themselves, of course, can choose to adopt more of the Carvana <laughs> model. I don't see why there's any reason why uh, car dealer groups, if they want to, can't over time copy what they're doing um, if they find it to be an attractive way of doing business. So, um, you know, they, it, it has the, that has the potential to be high return on capital business over time and stuff. I think that it's, it, it has a lot of potential. Um, so some of the other stuff is a little more complicated because while people say that they're buying through online, a lot of it is, um, so like there's a very big company in the UK that does online car stuff, which is basically just a, um, uh, way of, of, cars being listed and then they make commissions and stuff on it. Um, if you look and like you typed in stuff in the search, what's actually showing up is like Virtue is one of the biggest ones on there. Uh, you just don't notice it. But then when you realize and you look at the car, you go, oh, that car is actually at a Virtue dealership. And, uh, and I should also point out like for there's tons of sales of these things at the lower end. And I go into detail on that, which of course um, will be taken away from car dealers and will be sold online. Like buying cars for cash from people um, happens online all the time and will be a really big business. But it's worth mentioning that always happened like through classifieds and newspapers and stuff. That's not really how car dealers make a lot of their money. And also then there's like the group that I talked about there with the buy here, pay here type stuff. So people who are buying basic transportation, just I need a car. It can be 10 years old to get me to my job. Um, those aren't really the customers that car dealers make money off of. Those have always been the the group that uh, that you know companies like uh, CarMart and stuff make money on, and also that uh, literally buy cars for cash. They they buy very cheap cars using cash. You know, here's three thousand dollars. I'm going to buy the car completely right now. Um, that's not how car dealerships work. Got it. Cool. Well, I want to thank everybody so much for tuning in with Jeff and myself on today's podcast. If you want to get access to the Focus Compound Daily, of course, uh, you can go to focuscompound.com, enter in your email, um, or just go over to my Twitter at Focus Compound as it does get tweeted out every single day. If you're watching us on YouTube, hit that subscribe button, thumbs the video up, leave us a comment. Like I said, uh, I'm loving the engagement we're getting in the comments, and I'm trying to make a point to respond to everything. Um, and then, of course, if you're listening on the podcast side of things, a rating or review goes a long way for us. I want to thank everybody so much for tuning in with Jeff and myself, and we will. We'll see you in tomorrow's podcast.